The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you for showing up. This is Nathaniel McCone. He is a senior software engineer for Red Hat. Then no, also they say engineer. And he's been fascinated with JavaScript and the way it's exploded and taken off. And that's what he's going to speak about with you this morning. So I give you the invitation. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for coming. I know it's extremely early, um, and uh, if I am too loud, just cover your ears, hide under your desks, that'd be fine. Um, so today we're going to talk about building a secure and flexible JavaScript ecosystem. Now, probably from the title of this, uh, a lot of you have come here thinking that you're going to see lots of JavaScript code today. Uh, and you're not. Uh, this was my devilish plan to get lots of people interested in JavaScript uh, to actually show up and uh, he hear what we're really going to talk about, which is something very cool, but I'm not going to spoil the beans just yet. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about JavaScript history. Uh, it was first developed by Netscape uh, in 1995 and was added in Internet Explorer in 1996. It uh, rapidly went through a series of standardizations because people realized that it sort of needs to be standardized in order for websites to be able to work on all the different browsers. Uh, so the first three iterations of the ECMA spec uh, were, were done uh, each year in 97, 98, and 99. Uh, then we sort of had this lull in JavaScript activity for uh, really almost about 10 years. Um, I guess at least you could say eight years there. Um, and mostly this was because JavaScript just kind of worked. It worked in the browser. People were using it. They were, uh, at least back in the 90s, using it to, uh, to make little funky animations of people digging out things. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, we start seeing uh, some increased in activity here in the in the late 2000s. Uh, with Qt Script uh, was the was the first, to my knowledge, attempt to actually integrate uh, jo JavaScript into uh, another project as sort of like a scripting language, right? Uh, so this is sort of the first out of the browser uh, attempt at doing JavaScript in 2008. In two, we saw the release of two projects very similar to Qt Script, uh, GJS and Seed. And these two projects attempt to do the same thing that, that Qt Script does for Qt, uh, but to do it for uh, the G object type system, uh, which most commonly used is GTK. In 2009, uh, we saw an even further flurry of activity. Uh, we saw ECMA version 5 as uh, interest in JavaScript began to pick back up. Uh, we saw something called CommonJS develop, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And we also saw this really interesting project uh, get founded called Node.js. Uh, how many of you know what Node.js Node is? Uh, how many of you have played with Node.js? How many of you like Node.js? Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So basically what's happened is we've, we've had this, uh, this resurgence, and most of the resurgence in the last few years where all this sort of real innovation around JavaScript is happening is actually outside of the browser. Uh, for a long time it was sort of trapped in this browser land and the only way you could ever deploy a JavaScript on something or use it was to put JavaScript on a web page and deploy it out to the browser. Well, people got this brilliant idea that, you know, Let's look at the language. It's actually got some really great features. Uh, the first thing is that it's the most secure language ever, right? And the reason for this is really quite simple. It's not because it has a ton of security features. It's because it's a language that's designed to only uh, put into a sandbox the data that you want to manipulate in that sandbox. So by design, it's, it's inherently secure. Uh, and the reason why I say it's the most secure language ever is because when you think about it, JavaScript every single day is running trillions upon trillions of lines of untrusted code. Can you name any other language that runs that much untrusted code on a daily basis? I can't think of any. Uh, the other thing, uh, there's a few other features that are really interesting about JavaScript. It's available pretty much everywhere, pretty much every operating system, every architecture, uh, and it works pretty well everywhere. It's lightweight. 
uh, you, know, you may think, oh man, my browser, it just sucks up the memory usage. And I know that on my system, the browser and Eclipse are pretty much the, the two biggest memory hogs. Uh, well, you've got to think about this. I've probably got 100 tabs open, and each one of them is rendering an extremely complex document. Uh, and actually, when you pull out just the JavaScript part of it itself, it's actually really, really lightweight. It's also really fast, and this is uh, thanks to some research uh, by uh, Google, for instance, uh, when they introduced their V8 engine. Uh, it really sort of kicked everybody in the pants. And there's now this performance war between all the different JavaScript implementations of who can be the fastest. And they are rapidly uh, increasing to the point where uh, somebody actually just released a blog yesterday where in certain instances, uh, V8 can actually make JavaScript faster than a native function compiled by GCC. That's pretty incredible for our scripting language. Uh, it's also embeddable, right? Uh, a lot of the, the uh, embedded market is exploding. I don't know how many of you have a uh, mobile device of some sort in your pocket, right? The, uh, one of the biggest features of these devices is that they can run JavaScript, which means that they can access all of those trillions upon trillions of lines of untrusted code that are out there on the web. Uh, but not only just on the web, a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these products actually are using JavaScript pretty heavily internally. One I can think of explicitly is uh, HP's WebOS. I don't know if you've played with that at all or heard anything about it. Uh, but when you, if you're not doing native development code on that platform, which very few people are, uh, you are doing completely JavaScript programming. And that has nothing to do with the browser. You're just programming in JavaScript the, the user interface. Um, so it's embeddable. There's also a couple really great products out there, uh, like uh, Titanium. I don't know if you've heard of that, which is a JavaScript API for doing Android and, uh, and iOS development uh, in JavaScript, so you don't have to learn Objective-C in Java, right? And, it, and they do really well. It's a great product. I highly recommend it. Um, but one of the coolest features of JavaScript is uh, it has this concept called closures. And now closures have been around in languages for a while, uh, but they were introduced pretty much at the beginning of JavaScript. Which, and what this means is that you can uh, pass a function in as an object, and that function can be called back later and actually have a, a set of state with it, right, that it can, that it can finish up. And so this leads to JavaScript being a pretty event-driven language. You'll say, I want to fetch a web page, and here's a function, and call, me, call that function when, uh, when the web page is done loading. So the, one of the great things about that is that if, you've, if you spend any time sort of watching on development, uh, you know, uh, if, like GNOME Planet or things like that, uh, what you will immediately see is that there's a lot of talk about asynchronous programming. Uh, asynchronous programming is really hard, uh, and what, what you want to do is you don't want to say, okay, I want to read this file and sort of wait till the read happens, because you can't do anything else while you're doing that. You want to say, I want, I want you to read this file, but just sort of do it in the background. Let me know when, let me know when it comes back and is ready to be read. So, uh, so this is a, a huge push in programming as a whole. We want, we want more asynchronous uh, interfaces, and actually that's one of my jobs at Red Hat. My job is to actually bring uh, asynchronous uh, programming to a whole variety of stack. I work on the free IPA project, which is really cool. Uh, and so I gotta make it really fast, and, and my, my job is to make it event-driven. So, the, but this is one of the great features of JavaScript, that out of the box, it is an event-driven language. So a lot of people thought, you know, JavaScript can have uh, a lot of great functionality outside of the browser. So the first thing that they do is they look around and they pick an engine. So they'll, they'll, they'll pick one of the engines, and I'm going to actually go through the engines here. We're going to talk about uh, a, a little bit about each of the en JavaScript engines that are available. The first engine is SpiderMonkey, uh, and this is the first JavaScript engine that was ever written. Remember, uh, remember, JavaScript was created by Netscape in 1995. The Netscape code base eventually became the Mozilla code base, which eventually became the Firefox code base. Uh, so SpiderMonkey is actually that original JavaScript implementation that's been improved over, and over the years. It is used mainly by Firefox. There are a few other uh, products that use it. Um, but we'll see down at the bottom exactly what that means. Uh, it has a few pros. The first is it's a feature-driven JavaScript engine. Uh, it has advanced features that are not standardized. Uh, they're trying to sort of push the envelope on the standard of, of, of what things could, uh, could be like. There's three features that are probably the most critical. The first uh, is it has support for a little keyword called let. 
And let allows you to declare a variable in a local scope. For those of you who have done any JavaScript programming, you know that most variables that you create end up in the global scope. And so you can get a lot of uh, stomping over variable names as your program gets larger and larger. Well, the let keyword allows you to create a variable that is just local in scope. When you return from the function, that variable no longer exists. Uh, you have a, uh, a feature called yield, and for those of you who are familiar with asynchronous programming, uh, yield is a really great piece of functionality. What it allows you to do is you can, uh, instead of typing return to return a value from a function, you can type yield and it will return that value. But then the person who called the function can actually resume the function at the yield and continue processing. So you can actually have 10 yield statements in a single function and call that function 10 times. Each time it will resume processing where that last yield statement was until it gets all the way to the bottom. Now why would that be useful? You think you just want to get one value from a function, right? Well imagine you're trying to do again asynchronous programming. In asynchronous programming, uh, you can return this value uh, which might be a file descriptor. And the file descriptor gets added into a loop and waits until the file descriptor has something available to read. And then it calls back the function, function and resumes where you left off. So rather than having 10 different functions that respond to 10 different events uh, in the asynchronous model, you have one function with 10 yield statements. And so the, the flow of what you're actually trying to accomplish is all right in a row. It makes for really easy programming. The last feature that uh, SpiderMonkey uh, introduces is uh, called e for x uh, which stands for ECMAScript for XML. And what it actually does is it makes XML a, uh, a JavaScript object. So you can literally just type raw XML into a JavaScript file, and it's an object, and you can parse it and pass it around just like any other object in JavaScript. Uh, another, the last two pros of SpiderMonkey uh, is that it's fast. Uh, in fact, SpiderMonkey uh, in recent builds is pretty much as fast as all of the other engines. Um, with, uh, of course, each engine has you know, some, some positives and, and some drawbacks in terms of its speed, but SpiderMonk is really fast. Uh, it also has broad architecture support, and this is due to the fact that it's one of the oldest implementations, and uh, it's been around for a long time, and people are using it on every architecture imaginable, x86, you know, MIPS, uh, ARM, and then even the really obscure, obscure ones as well. It does have some cons, though. The older versions are slower. So if you don't have the sort of you know, most crack-induced release of uh, SpiderMonkey, then you are going to get slower performance. Uh, it has no unbundled releases, and this is, with the next one, probably the, the most significant drawback to SpiderMonkey. Um, how many of you know that, that uh, Firefox has rapidly uh, increased their release schedule? They're now going to be on, I believe it's a six-month schedule, is that right? In order to do that, they have basically said to anyone that's using any of the Mozilla components, shove off. The reason for that is they don't want to commit to API stability at all. Uh, they want to be able to change the library as often as they want in backwards incompatible ways, and uh, they don't care about anyone that's outside of Firefox. They only care about the Firefox ecosystem. And that is their prerogative, but SpiderMonkey's cool, and I want to use it outside of Firefox, so what should I do? Um, if you're a library that's trying to depend on SpiderMonkey, you're going to have a hard time as they continue to make these backwards and compatible changes to, to actually maintain uh, your support for SpiderMonkey. Um, one of the other drawbacks is that SpiderMonkey is most often bundled with ZoolRunner. Uh, now, actually, th this is one of the things that has changed for the positive lately. Uh, there is one guy who is uh, creating individual releases of just the SpiderMonkey engine. Uh, several distributions pack package it. Um, I know that Fedora ships it. Uh, so that's nice because it doesn't necessarily have to be bundled with ZoolRunner, which is a pretty big package, has a pretty big memory footprint. Um, but uh, for those of you who are stuck with being integrated with ZoolRunner, you have a memory hit as you have to load in this big library that really has nothing to do with JavaScript. The second engine uh, we'll talk about here is V8. V8 is used mainly by the Chrome or Chromium browser. Uh, how many of you have, have used that browser? It's, it's actually a pretty nice browser and it's extremely fast. 
Uh, the reason it's extremely fast is because the JavaScript engine, as you can see in the pros, is focused on speed. Um, and like I already said, uh, there was a blog post just this weekend about how in some instances JavaScript on V8 is actually faster than native code compiled with GCC. Um, one of the other neat features about V8 is that it allows you to manage the scope of, of the objects on the stack. Uh, now this is actually talking about on the native side of things, right? Not, the, not inside the JavaScript sandbox, but when you're programming in C++. Um, rather than having to do all kinds of, of funky reference counting to make sure that your objects are still around when you need them, uh, the scope is managed on the stack, which means you can just pass it like a normal parameter, and it just sort of keeps track of everything on its own. Uh, V8 does have some cons. The architecture support is uneven. It's a, newer, uh, it's a newer JavaScript engine. And one of the biggest problems is that uh, because V8 is so performance optimized, uh, there, are, there are large chunks of it written in assembly. And so for those of you who know how to program in assembly, uh, you know that it's really not very portable. Uh, so what happens is that every time you want to introduce it to a new architecture, you have to essentially rewrite that core part of V8. Uh, now the two, <clears throat> the two architectures that are probably most common right now, x86 uh, and ARM uh, for all your mobile devices, are, are both supported by, by V8 and their V8 is a pretty good choice. Uh, but if you want to run it anywhere else, um, good luck. And uh, so it does have some cons, uh, or some further cons. Uh, there's no C API. So if you are writing a C application, not a C++ application, uh, you're pretty much also out of luck. Uh, only the C++ API is supported. Just like SpiderMonkey, V8 has no API stability. And again, they do change things uh, pretty often. Uh, they're probably a little bit better than, than Mozilla is, uh, but, uh, but there have been some changes that have, have caught people uh, in the butt. Um, can you say handle scope? Has anybody actually programmed with the V8 API? Okay, so they have this thing called handle scope, and this is the way that you actually get to manage uh, the variables on the stack, which is, a, which is a pro. The problem is you have to have handle scope everywhere. And the problem is it's a little buggy. Um, sometimes you'll pass an object to a function and you don't actually get the same exact object. Now it looks pretty much the same, but one of the bugs I ran into when using it was that uh, the private pointers that I had actually stored in that object were gone. Uh, so it's a little buggy and it's really, really hard to sort of debug. V8 also has no uh, innovative language features, uh, unlike SpiderMonkey. SpiderMonkey has the, the features like uh, XML and JavaScript uh, and others, uh, but V8 does not. They have no intention of pushing the envelope whatsoever. They just want it to be fast and lean. JavaScript core sort of represents uh, the in-between of those two. It is uh, used mainly by WebKit uh, and Safari, and it's developed primarily by Apple. Uh, it does have some pros that the others don't have. It does have a stable C API. It also has broad architecture support. I can't think of any architecture where it doesn't work. Uh, it's available by default on modern Mac and Linux, which is, and uh, mobile devices as well, uh, including, uh, including iOS devices, but unfortunately not Android. Um, which means that if you wanted to use a C, uh, JavaScript C API, and you want it to have, you know, pretty much be available everywhere, WebKit's your only choice. Um, however, uh, it, al oh, it also has integration with, with uh, Qt uh, from version 4.3. That's the Qt script I was talking about. Uh, and then uh, some of the cons. It is tightly coupled with WebKit, GTK, Qt, and Core Foundation. Uh, what this means is that if you do want to use JavaScript Core, you have to pull in the entire GTK stack or you have to pull in the entire Q QT stack or the entire core foundation stack. That's not terrible, but again, like Zool Runner, that's a lot of memory for something that you're probably not gonna use if you just want JavaScript. Another con is that it's not as fast as SpiderMonkey or V8. Uh, I know that Apple is working on this to get it faster, but uh, they, they still haven't gotten there quite yet. Uh, no innovative lingu language features, just like V8. They have no intention of pushing the barrier. They just want to support what is the baseline ECMAScript. There's another con that's not listed here that I should probably mention, um, and that is Apple has a nasty habit of not releasing the source code for JavaScript core. 
So they'll do a whole bunch of performance improvements and then not actually release them until six months to a year later. Um, and so this basically means that if you do want, you know, that new cool feature or that awesome new speed improvement that came out in V8 or Spider Monkey, well, you're probably going to have to wait a year and a half to two years before you can actually use that uh, on any given platform. One last uh, engine, which is sort of the oddball out here, is Rhino. Uh, Rhinoball is, Rhino is used in the Java world, and it's developed by Mozilla. Since it's developed by Mozilla, uh, it also is very featureful. It, can, it contains support for let yield and E4X. It has broad architecture support. Uh, the reason for this is because it's on the JVM, right? So it'll run anywhere that the JVM runs. Uh, one of the really nice features of Rhino is that it has a transparent bridge to Java classes. So if you want to, you know, if you've got a big Java application and you want to make it JavaScript compatible, you can just plug in Rhino, and Rhino can, uh, via JavaScript, manipulate all those Java objects for you, and you don't really have to do anything. You get it for free. The downside of Rhino is that it is extremely slow. Um, I, for one, am not of the opinion that the JVM is really a great platform for, uh, for JavaScript. I think that there's sort of an impedance mismatch with some of the language design choices. Um, and the other, the other downside is that Rhino pretty much lives in a Java ghetto. So if you're doing Java and JavaScript, you're using Rhino. And if you're doing JavaScript but not using Java, you're not using Rhino. So that's, that's pretty much the, the major downside to Rhino. So as we've gone through these engines, something should pretty clearly come to your mind, and that is uh, if you do want to use JavaScript outside of the browser, you have to pick an engine, but there's not really a universal best solution, right? There's a best solution perhaps on Android, and there's a best solution on iOS or on Mac, and maybe on Linux, but maybe even not there, right? So which engine do you use? Well, most of these projects that are doing out of the browser JavaScript stuff, uh, they just go ahead and pick one of the engines and they accept that there's pros and cons and those pros and cons just get inherited by the project itself. Um, the next step that they do is they say, oh my God, we need to have modules, right? So this is pretty much like any language where you have an import statement or an include statement and you can pull in other stuff. And the reason that this is really handy, of course, is that you can actually create reusable code. Uh, I, can, I can make a module uh, that you know, connects to a web server and downloads a file, and someone else can make a, a module that, uh, that downloads or that connects to IRC and sends chat messages. And then I can hook those two modules together, and I can download something from a website and paste it in an IRC chat room. Right? So modules are really, really handy. Uh, so uh, the, that's the very first thing that an out-of-browser uh, JavaScript pro uh, program does, is they say, we need to have a way to load modules. Uh, the third thing that the out-of-the-browser project does is they tightly couple with their niche. So in the case of Node.js, does anybody know what Node.js's niche is? Okay, what's the tagline when you go to the Node.js website? Anybody know? Evented I.O. for JavaScript, right? Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's what they do. They do evented I.O. And if you want to do GTK in Node.js, sorry, not supported. If you want to do Qt in, in, uh, in Node.js, sorry, not supported. If you want to uh, program a uh, Mac user interface, sorry, not supported. You, you sort of get where I'm going with this? They've picked a niche. And that niche is probably a pretty good niche and, and has a lot of people that are interested. But it means that if you want to then expand beyond what that niche is, you face a lot of pain because there's a lot of things that they've made design choices where you can't actually mix and match from all of those different programming areas. So imagine the case, and, and perhaps my HTTP and IRC example is a bad one, but imagine in a case where you had Node.js uh, with a HTTP module and you had some other project uh, with an IRC module and you can't use them together. Right? That, that cool hack that you did to download something from a website and post it to an IRC channel can't work because you have these uh, separate towers set up. Uh, so here's just a, a list of some of the more prominent out-of-browser JavaScript projects. And you can see that there's actually quite a few of them. 
Each one of them has their own niche. I'll just pick out a few of them. I've already mentioned Node.js and their niche is Evented I.O. for JavaScript. Uh, you have underneath it uh, V8 CGI. Uh, can anybody guess what V8 CGI does? It does CGI! It's JavaScript for CGI, right? Uh, and if you want to use uh, V8 CGI to do Evented I.O. for JavaScript, can you? Kind of, maybe. But you're not going to be able to use all the cool stuff from Node.js. Okay, what about MongoDB? MongoDB, by the way, is a, a project that I'm particularly a fan of. Uh, it's a database that allows you to store JSON objects, and they have a nice little JavaScript shell that, that does a bunch of stuff. Um, so let's say I'm running MongoDB, and I want to import that cool module that I had on V8 CGI. Oh, I can't. So you can see sort of the problem here. There's a lot of fragmentation. Each one of these has a different engine and a different module loader, which means that none of them are compatible with one another. Does this remind you of, uh, of a certain day back in the 70s when your computers wouldn't talk to one another? I mean, really, are we going to accept this in our modern age? I, I would really hope not. So returning to this, we see that the, uh, the top priorities for, for these projects on the bottom are, really don't make sense. You don't want to pick an engine, and you don't want to just pick a module loader out of nowhere. So fortunately, there is this project called CommonJS. And you can get to uh, more information about CommonJS at commonjs.org. Uh, it was founded in 2009. And the goal of CommonJS is to develop a standard module system. This is the module loader itself that, that loads the modules. Uh, and the goal here is that uh, all the modules from one project should work on another project. Um, it also attempts to establish a standard library specification. Now, you would think that because there's a standard library specification and a common module system that you could use all of the modules on any of the other projects. We're going to find out that that's not true here in a moment. Um, CommonJS is gaining fairly broad adoption, but I think that the adoption that it's receiving is not really based upon the fact that it's a good standard, but that it's the only standard. Uh, it's focused on non-native code which means that if you write a module in pure JavaScript uh, in one place, you can import it in another. And that actually is a big benefit. Unfortunately, it's not the hard problem. That's the easy problem. It's easy to open a file and evaluate JavaScript. That, that's super simple. What's hard is actually making compatibility for the native layer underneath it. And unfortunately, uh, CommonJS is very minimalistic, and it's underdocumented at times. Uh, it alleviates somewhat, but it doesn't solve the fragmentation problems. And uh, it's mostly focused on synchronous operations. Oh, I forgot to mention it's focused on, focused on non-native code. Um, like I said, you can load a JavaScript module, but there, uh, for CommonJS, there is no specification for what should happen if that module needs to interact with, I don't know, say C or C++. Now, how, much, how many out of the browser modules are there in JavaScript? Well, there's some. How many C libraries are there out there? Right? There's a lot of C code out there. And if you think we're going to re-implement all of that C code in JavaScript, you're absolutely nuts. The real problem we have to solve is not just simply loading some JavaScript and evaluating it. We have to solve the, the native API. So the current state of our ecosystem is engine fragmentation. Let's take, let's take one particular example of this, and that is we want to write a JavaScript applica application that connects to MySQL. Pretty straightforward, right? A lot of people are going to want to do this. So they pick one of their, uh, going back here, they pick one of their projects. And how many of these, by the way, do you think actually have MySQL modules? I think it's only two. I think it's only two, right? So let's, let's assume that you have, uh, let's assume you've chosen one of these projects to work with, and it doesn't have a MySQL module. Well, let's write one. And normally, we would write one, and then we would share it everywhere in the ecosystem, right? This is the way Python works. This is the way Ruby works. This is the way PHP works. But why doesn't JavaScript work this way? Well, the first problem is, remember, we, the first thing they did was pick an engine. Well, what that means is that each of these projects is tied to the engine, V8, SpiderMonkey, JavaScript Core, or Rhino. That means you've got to write the module four times. I don't know how many of you, but if, 
are, are going to write a module four times and then try to keep it actually maintained. That, that's never going to scale, not in a volunteer environment. The problem is it actually gets worse. Because, because each project has basically said, okay, we're going to, uh, we're going to create a module loader, which is that ability to import, import modules, um, they're all different. And so in the case of our MySQL uh, database driver, each JavaScript project has its own module loader, and CommonJS says nothing about native code interop. So what this means is that you have uh, a, a vastly expanding number of MySQL modules that you need to write. So the number of MySQL modules that you need to write is actually the number of engines that are available times the number of, uh, of uh, module loader implementations that there are. So in our case, let's go back to this list. There's at least 10 projects here, right? You have four engines times 10 projects means you have to write the MySQL module 40 times. Does anybody know anywhere where there's somebody doing this successfully? No, it doesn't work. Okay, so maybe it's not that bad. Uh, you could actually perhaps, you know, write a module in native code on one engine and then maybe have some if defs to handle a couple different module loaders. So maybe it's not as bad as the picture that I've painted here, but it is still pretty bad. We also have another problem here. Uh, does anybody remember what the number one feature was that I touted about JavaScript? Security. It's the most secure language ever. It runs trillions upon trillions of lines of untrusted code. And so people, when they have decided they want to use JavaScript outside of the browser, they say, uh, the first thing they say is, yay, we want to have modules. So they say, yay, we broke the sandbox. Oh my god, we just broke the sandbox. Right? Because they haven't thought about security up front. They haven't thought about what happens if you can just load native code into your sandbox at any time with no restrictions. And to my knowledge, there is not a single JavaScript, uh, out of the browser JavaScript project that has any restrictions whatsoever on how modules are loaded. That is a security nightmare. Uh, we need a policy for which modules are allowed in the sandbox and what they are allowed to do and how to configure them. Let's give an example. Going back to our MySQL uh, example here, we, uh, we require the MySQL module, and this imports the, the MySQL module. And then we want to connect to a database. So how many people have seen something like this in code somewhere? Right? If you're a PHP programmer, you've probably seen this pattern everywhere. Uh, we want to connect to a database, so write our password into the source code. Should that be allowed? That's ridiculous. Why would you put a password in source code, check it into revision control? What happens if somebody hacks your revision control? Now they have the passwords for your database. That's utterly ridiculous. So should the, should the uh, anti-pattern be allowed? No, absolutely not. You should design for security up front. So in this example here, this does the exact same thing. But where did all that configuration go? We've actually made the configuration orthogonal to the code, right? So that when you run this, you specify, here is my MySQL configuration, and then when it gets to the point where it connects to MySQL, it just calls connect and doesn't need to have passwords and usernames and ports inside the code. We also have uh, a problem of native type security. All engines allow pri uh, private pointers, and the idea here is that uh, when you are interacting with native code, you will have some kind of a pointer that represents state. And you need to pass that state around inside the JavaScript sandbox. But putting the actual pointer inside the JavaScript sandbox has all kinds of really bad security impl uh, implications. And so uh, one of the things that it allows you to do is that from the C API, you can actually hide a pointer inside an object. Now, when you're messing around with that object inside JavaScript, um, all, all that you can see is the object. You can't see that there's a pointer. You don't even know that there's a pointer actually there. But what happens is then you can pass that JavaScript object into a function, and if that function is native code, it can actually pull out that pointer and resume the state of, of whatever the operation was. So in the case we have here, uh, usually it's just uh, you have some uh, JavaScript object on the top, and you call get pointer, and it gives you the pointer, because you can only generally store one pointer in a given object. Well, this has huge security impl uh, implications. What type is the pointer? G given, given the example I've shown here, uh, let's say that you import the XML object and you make a new XML object. So you have that object there, it's stored in, in OBJ. 
And then you import MySQL and you connect and you pass the object as this into the connect function. Does that native code have any understanding of what type that pointer is? Not at all. So if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you'll get a crash. And that's it, and that's, uh, that's it, by the way, if you've not done all kinds of checking, which is usually like 20 lines of checking for every pointer you want to manage. Uh, if you're lucky, you get a crash. If you're unlucky, you have a security breach, right? Because all of a sudden, I have uh, written text inside of my XML object, and I pass it in to the MySQL object, and the MySQL object attempts to execute that text. Uh, so. Uh, the problem here is that because people haven't thought ahead of how they should implement their pointers, uh, you have a huge security problem that if, they, if the programmer using the JavaScript engine is not entirely vigilant at every single step of the way with every pointer that they manage, which is, by the way, a lot, then they're going to have security holes. And that, and that needs to be fixed. So coming to a conclusion here, uh, the ecosystem uh, is, has, uh, is highly fragmented and it makes code reuse impossible. Module loaders uh, also break the number one feature of JavaScript, which is the sandbox. And generally speaking, security is an afterthought. So this to me is a really lament lamentable state for a language that's really the most secure language ever. Hi, this is Natty. Uh, Natty uh, is not related to a narwhal. Uh, so you should just you should be aware of that right there. Uh, Natty is the mascot for my pet project, which I'm here to talk to you about, which is called Natus. Natus is a secure by design JavaScript meta engine. It's MIT licensed, and you can see the the website there, uh, natusproject.com, and the code is on uh, GitHub.com forward slash Natus. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how Notus works. Let me get through this, and we'll sort of circle back and talk about the items uh, in detail. It's, an, it's engine agnostic C++ JavaScript API, and I hope to get stable pretty soon. Uh, everything does work right now, and uh, there's a, still a little bit of cleanup I want to do, but uh, for the most part, the core is, is pretty stable. Uh, it supports SpiderMonkey, JavaScript Core, and V8. Uh, it doesn't support uh, Rhino, but if somebody wanted to write that patch, I'd probably be willing to take it. Uh, it is, uh, if you're using the C++ API, by the way, I have both a C and a C++ API and it, and it follows native conventions for both languages. Uh, if you're using the C++ API, uh, just like V8, the scope is managed on the stack, which allows you to not have to worry about things. It means that the C++ programming feels very scriptish. Uh, it also has a read line enable uh, REPL, AKA a JavaScript shell. Uh, this is what allows you to actually you know, type in JavaScript uh, on your Linux box or your Mac box. Um, we have language bindings. Uh, actually, this statement is a lie. Uh, we do have Python bindings, but I broke some stuff in the, in the latest version, and I need to fix them. So they're currently broken, but they'll be fixed shortish. Uh, it, it has a secure by design module loader. Uh, the module loader permits things like uh, whitelisting, uh, we do out-of-band configuration, so this is where you take the passwords out of your code, right? Store them in an, an out-of-band configuration, and then when you when you call that connect function, uh, you just you just connect it. And modules can use that out-of-band configuration, right? So they can propose their own configuration uh, going forward. Uh, we have name namespaced and typed pointers, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and uh, we are uh, slowly implementing common JS modules. So this is, this is how Natus works. Uh, on the bottom, you have the three main engines that we've talked about, V8, JavaScript Core, and SpiderMonkey. And the first thing that Natus does uh, in libNatus is provide an API abstraction. Now, if you're an application and you don't care about modules, all you want to do is provide some inscripting for your application, built-in scripting for your application in JavaScript, but you don't want the ability to load modules, you can use this API abstraction layer directly in your application. Uh, however, uh, as most people are probably going to want to do, uh, they're probably going to want to use modules, right? Uh, and then really nice thing is that you should be able to use those modules in the Natus shell. You should be able to use them in custom applications that are built on top of Natus. Uh, and you should be able to use them in things like mod Natus for, for Apache or, or any other place. Uh, so we've also developed a module loader. Uh, and the module loader does try as best as we are able to comply to the common JS spec. 
Uh, but the really, really interesting thing is that the module loader uses the Natus API abstraction layer. This means that if you write a MySQL module, how many times do you have to write it? Once. And it runs on all the engines. And, it, and so you don't have this, this huge amount of fragmentation. Uh, then built on top of that, you can implement your modules. Uh, and you can have a JavaScript shell, and then you can run applications uh, up on top of there as well. So you could have an application that runs in the shell uh, and uses the modules. Any questions about this? So here, here's an example, and this is the, the biggest code example you're going to get uh, for the day. Um, this is an example of how to use not to. So uh, we create this engine object on the top. This is the C++ API, by the way. Um, and then we initialize it. Notice that we're passing in a string that says v8. You can pass in here a, a string that says spider monkey. You can pass in a string that says JavaScript core. Or you can actually pass null here. And Natus will do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, the first thing that it will actually do is uh, attempt to uh, determine if you're already linked to a JavaScript library through any other mechanism. right? So let's say in my application, I've linked against WebKit because I want to use the WebKit browser, but then I also want to use Natus modules. If you pass null here, Natus will detect that you're already linked against WebKit, and then will choose the JavaScript core module for you. Uh, then what you do, once you have an engine, this engine is, is the context for a particular uh, uh, engine on the bottom there in the, in the previous slide. Uh, you create a new global, and a new global is a, a global object, and that represents a sandbox. Anything you put inside of the sandbox is available to JavaScript. Uh, anything that's not inside the sandbox is, uh, is, um, is not in the global. Uh, so here we use our global to evaluate some JavaScript. We create a variable that x that's equal to 15. And the interesting thing is that we get a result back, and we can convert that, that result into a, a negative or a native integer uh, in C++. Uh, we also have a require system. Remember I talked about the module loader? Uh, it's called require. And uh, you initialize the module system. Uh, and that, that second line is the important one for that out-of-band configuration where it says my config. We're going to talk about this in detail in a minute. But the my config represents uh, that out-of-band configuration that you can pass in. That configuration can be used by any of the modules that are actually loaded uh, into the system. So in this example, we're going to load a module. And then the last one on the bottom, uh, we're going to load that same exact module, but we're going to do it using, uh, do, using JavaScript rather than native code. So those last two statements are the same. Overall, it's pretty simple. I mean, we, we booted up a JavaScript environment in, what, four lines of code? That, that's not bad. And it's compatible, and it works on all the engines. Anybody have any questions about this? I'll leave it up here for a second just to sort of let it soak in. I know, I know people are reading it. Yeah? I was looking for another uh, picture of your application outline. This one here? Right. Um, I just wonder if there. Sure. Uh, the, these slides uh, will be available on my blog, uh, by the way. Um, actually, I should probably just put them up on the website. I'll put them up on the website in the next 24 hours or so. Natusproject.com, yeah. OK, so one of the things that we do is namespace pointers. And if you remember back to the example I was talking about before, in all of the underlying JavaScript engines, you can save a pointer into an object, but you lose the type of the pointer. And because there's only one, uh, in most of the engines, there's only one uh, pointer, private pointer per object, if somebody passes in an object with some pointer that, to some memory that you don't know what what it is, uh, you have a real security problem, and you're probably going to get crashes, and you're probably going to get security holes. So Natus saves this by putting every pointer uh, into a namespace. Uh, and so if you want to store five different pointers, just give them five different namespaces. And then you can pull out that pointer by the namespace later on. This means that the pointer is always the pointer you expect it to be. And this is just a native part of the API, right? You don't have to do any extra code on top of it. We've basically given you security for free. However, that's not all. Uh, in uh, 0.2.1, our latest release, we also just released a typed pointer implementation. 
And you can see here on the top example, we store a G object pointer. And then later, we retrieve that G object pointer. Notice the last line in the bottom, when we try to get a, ch a char star pointer, there is no pointer of that type. It just returns null because we've never stored one in there. So this is really helpful because it gives you, again, security up front, and it allow, also allows you to store multiple pointers in an object. Um, V8 does allow, to, uh, does allow you to store multiple pointers in an object, but they're just an array, and so you don't get any type information like this. So you don't get the security benefit. Nautus also supports out-of-band configuration. So if we go back to this, this big example here, remember where we initialized the module system here? and we pass in config here, we're now gonna look at exactly what's inside this my config. My config is a JSON string. So most of you are probably familiar or have at least heard of JSON, right? Uh, this is a JSON string and, and you, basically create a, uh, you basically create a hierarchy of JSON that gets passed in and then modules uh, in their native code, we don't expose the configuration into the sandbox uh, but, uh, but the native, native code can read this configuration as just normal JavaScript objects uh, and can interact with it. Now there's, there's, uh, there's two ways you can actually pass in this configuration. The first example here is if you were to hard code it in native code. Uh, so when you, in, when you initialize that require system, you pass in manually some JSON data. Now that's not the way most people are going to use it and it's not really the most interesting part of the functionality. Uh, but it is there for embedders if you want that kind of stuff. Uh, the way most people are going to use it is that they're going to be able to uh, set their configuration at runtime. So in the second example here, you can see the dash C option is mysql.host and then some JSON value. And what will happen here is that mysql.host uh, will actually be set to one, the string 127.0.0.1. Uh, user will be set to root, pass will be set to password, or to pass, and port will be set to 3306, and then we execute the script, right? So when that script then calls, uh, imports the, the MySQL module and calls connect, it's just going to connect to this configuration that we've passed it. Anybody have any questions about this? Nautus also has an origin system. The way that security works in a web browser is that uh, the web browser will fetch a JavaScript file. That JavaScript file can also do HTTP requests, but it's only permitted uh, to HTTP request from where the pages were fetched from. Uh, and that's a really good security model. Uh, it doesn't exactly translate 100% to Nautus, but we liked the idea of being able to lock something down to only talking to a few amount of things. Uh, so normally when you execute Nautus, the code runs completely unconstrained. Uh, if you want to connect to MySQL, you can. However, you can also lock things down. Notice that we're just stand specifying a standard configuration mechanism here, right? Uh, dash C, dash capital C, natus.origins.whitelist. So we're inserting into the origins whitelist uh, this item TCP 127.0.0 uh, colon one two three four. This means that uh, all modules can only, because it's a whitelist, can only connect to the local host port one two three four. Okay. Now, notice the third block here, when we try to connect to MySQL on port 3306, what do we get? We don't get success. We actually get an exception, which is a security error. It's a security error because you, that module is attempting to communicate with uh, something that is, that, is, uh, that is filtered out by the whitelist. Uh, in the native code, how this looks, and this is just an example here on the bottom of what this looks like in native code, uh, the point is if security is hard to implement, people are going to do it wrong. So what we, what we attempt to do is we attempt to make it really, really easy. So we have Natus check origin, and we know that the file name that's going to be passed in uh, is in the first argument, so argument zero. We're going to convert it to a C string, and we are going to join it to uh, the file prefix. So what this is saying is this function is getting a file name in the first argument, and we want to check with the origin system whether or not that, that file uh, access should be allowed. 
And if not, it will automatically throw a uh, security error for us. So you gain security with one line. Again, if security is hard to implement, people are going to do it wrong. So I figure with one line, that's about as small as I can make it. To go a little bit over Natu's history, uh, we've been rapidly developing. Our first release uh, was in December. Uh, we had four releases in December, two in February, one in April, one in May, and uh, we will probably have one in June as well. So you can see things are, are developing pretty rapidly. Uh, just to give you an idea of some recent history, this is just in the last uh, month or so. Uh, 2.0 was a full rewrite, uh, which decreased memory usage by 75%. Uh, it's a major new API, and it should be much easier to use. This is hopefully the last uh, API rewrite. I, I, I haven't seen any problems so far that would indicate to me that we need to do anything major from this point forward. Um, we have uh, full test suite coverage. This means that every change in Nautus uh, is actually run through unit tests. Uh, and this is really important to keep high quality and to maintain security. Uh, modules were moved to a separate package in 0.2. They have rotted a little bit. Uh, my plan is to fix them up uh, as soon as I get 0.2.2 out the door. Um, so right now, there's not a huge module community, but why do you think I'm here talking to you? Um, and then uh, we also introduced in 0.2 uh, Mac OS X support, uh, but it does support JavaScript core only. Uh, it's not that the others can't be built. It's just that I, there's not really a standard way to do it on OS X. So if you would like to submit patches to support the other engines, uh, gladly I will take them. They should be pretty small. Um, and then in 0.2.1, uh, we have vastly improved tab completion. Uh, and this means that pretty much any object that you want to uh, do tab completion in in the shell just works. Uh, we also added the typed pointer support, which I already talked about. And we also rewrote the uh, require system to make it uh, comply to the standard a little bit better in an area where the uh, standard was not clear, but where most of the implementations did it one way. Um, so it should, not to should uh, integrate better with uh, other require systems uh, as of 0.2.1. Our current status uh, is that we have uh, 0.2.1 uh, is our latest release. Our roadmap is that we are going to have uh, 0.2.2 shortly, hopefully in the next couple weeks. Uh, this is mostly API cleanup, and we're going to move the, the module system to a separate library. This is so that applications who do not want the module system can load just the abstraction layer, uh, and all, but then also optionally link to the module system. Uh, zero, in 0 0.3, we're going to do uh, some, a little bit of a radical change. Uh, hope it shouldn't change the API too much. Uh, but we're actually going to do main loop integration. Like I said before, one of the things that I work on at Red Hat is doing uh, evented main loop integrations for a variety of software projects. Uh, and we are working on a solution uh, to the problem of the fact that there's about six major main loops that applications use, and they're all incompatible with one another, which means that if you uh, want to use uh, a, an event loop in, in one application, uh, and in a, another application uses a different event loop, and then you try to mix stuff, it just doesn't work at all. So we're going to solve that problem. Uh, in fact, I've already got real code that actually works. Um, and I'm going to be integrating that into Natus so that we can provide a default main loop similar to what Node.js does for evented I.O. But our implementation is not going to be locked down to a particular event loop, which means we're going to be compatible with uh, Qt and with, um, and with GTK and with Node.js. Uh, once that's in place, one of the really... Uh, one of the ideas I would like to do is I'd like to look into uh, how to actually support Node.js on top of Natus, because it is possible. Uh, the, the question is, what would that take? And I, I haven't researched that yet. So that will probably come in, in maybe the, the .4 range. Um, and then uh, the, in the .9 range will be our beta, and that will be a proposed stable API. And when we do uh, 1.0, we will have a stable API and hopefully never change it. So help me God. We need help. Um, if you want to help in any way, we could use evangelists telling people, hey, don't use V8 na natively, uh, or don't use uh, you know, some other project for something niche. Let's, let's try to use Natus and, and build up an ecosystem around out of the browser JavaScript. Uh, one of the cool things, by the way, uh, that I like to give as an example to people is that you could use Natus to build a browser. 
okay? And you could have V8 running in one tab, JavaScript core running in another, and SpiderMonkey running in another. For th that's sort of the web programmer's like perfect situation, right? Where you can actually test against all the engines in a single browser. Um, we need help with documentation. Uh, I've been pretty lax at doing documentation. The website is up uh, and provides some stuff. Uh, with the next release, I'm going to really work heavily on getting stuff documented, but we could always use more help. Uh, if you are an infrastructure guy, a system admin, uh, we do have a website up and running, uh, but uh, we, really, we really do need a mailing list and stuff like that, and I just haven't had the time to look into it. So if you're somebody that likes to help with that kind of stuff, uh, I would love to talk to you. Uh, we definitely need uh, core hackers, so people who are interested in, in actually working on Natus uh, coding in C and C++. Uh, we could use that. We, and we also want people to just build modules on top of Natus. Uh, we, we want the whole goal of this is to make a reusable infrastructure so that people can uh, you know, take code, make it available, and that other people can use it. Uh, the last thing is bindings. Uh, we would love to be able to support uh, Natus in lots of different languages. By the way, uh, the, the Python bindings are really cool. You can actually pass JavaScript objects into Python and Python objects back into JavaScript and you can completely mix them around uh, and it just sort of works if you don't care about your memory usage. Um, Mixing two dynamic languages is cool in concept, but if you're going to build like a big project on it, the problem is you have reference counting in Python and reference counting in JavaScript, and you get cross-references and they never resolve, so your objects are never freed. So you just leak memory continuously. Um, but it is cool for small projects. So thank you very much. Uh, check out natusproject.com and, and our cute little mascot, Natty. And uh, any questions? Yes? Um, the answer is no, um, not that I'm opposed to such a thing. Uh, I've used Swig on a couple projects, uh, and my, my opinion of Swig is that it's, it's quick to get up and running, but it's very hard to maintain. Um, I, find that, I find that writing them nati natively is hard to maintain, but if somebody wants to add support to Swig for not to, I'm all for it. Um, Generally speaking, I advise people use the C++ API. It's a little bit, it's a little bit cleaner. Um, and writing modules in C++ is really a pretty trivial task. So, but yeah, that's, if you want to write that, I will, I will gladly accept the patch if I need to, or if Swig needs to, I will lean on people. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think that you are thinking of, uh, oh, what's it called now? Um, what is that library? That, that there's a library for that, a native library to help with la native library loading. Um, you're, I think you're thinking of like C types in Python or something like that. Is that, is that equivalent? Um, so yes, um, I'm hesitant to introduce it f up front. And the reason for that is, um, Natus is designed for security, and if you, if, you haven't, if you haven't picked that up, you haven't been listening. Um, it, I can give you that module, and it's really cool, but what it means is that it, it essentially breaks the sandbox again, uh, because you can do native code directly from JavaScript. It uh, means that all of the problems that we've worked very hard to solve and make sure that they don't happen essentially go out the window. Um, it is better for you to, rather than writing pure JavaScript on top of something like a C-types library. Uh, it's better for you to write a native implementation. That way you can preserve the sandbox. Uh, it also allows you to do things like uh, take advantage of the configuration uh, system. If, if you're attempting to use C-types, you're not going to have any access to the configuration. Um, so doing the cool things like MySQL Connect will not be available to you. Um, so I'm not opposed to it, but it just comes with a, a bunch of big warnings, and, and if I could make them flash in HTML, I would. <laughs> Actually, you can, but yeah. Any other questions? I know I've sort of fire-hosed you a bit. But it's a lot of fun, and I have fun working on it. Oh, well, let me give you a demo. I forgot about this. 
So I don't have any modules installed right now, so the demo is going to be uh, not very good. But uh, there's Natus. By the way, uh, does anybody know what the word Natus means? No Latin scholars? I uh, means birth. Means birth. Um, so anyway, um, so here's Natus. Uh, you'll notice that it shows the version right at the top, and it shows me what engine we're using. Right? I'm going to type tab here, and you can actually get a, a tab completion of all of the objects that are currently in the sandbox. Now, right now, there's really nothing in the sandbox except for the st these are all the standard objects that you get uh, anytime you initialize a JavaScript environment. Uh, but you can do tab completion uh, on these objects. So I just did tab completion on JSON, for instance. Uh, I can create, let's, uh, so let's create a variable called D and we'll create a new date. So that, that's the new date that we've just created there. Um, now the interesting thing is we've got tab completion. So all of the functions uh, for, uh, for the date object are all there. So if I wanted to, for instance, convert it to JSON, there it is in JSON. So, uh, and, and the tab completion all works and it will work with any objects that you create and put in the sandbox. So any, any last questions? Thank you all, all very much for coming. I hope I did not put you to sleep and uh, appreciate it very much. Thanks. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.